Welcome. Thank you for watching this Bible teaching from Island Community Church in downtown Memphis, Tennessee. We hope today's message will help you grow in relationship with Jesus. You can access more gospel resources and ways to connect with our church at iccmemphis.com or by downloading our Island Community Church app. Thanks again for joining us. Has anybody ever here ever been 16? Okay. All of those who are over 16 should answer in the affirmative, right? So at one time I was 16, I won't tell you how long ago, but I thought I was the coolest kid ever. Y'all remember that time when you graduate from your learner's license to your driver's license and the first time you like pull out of your driveway without your parents in the car? Anybody think that was like the coolest moment ever? Wow, I was so cool. I started driving at first a, a Mazda truck, a little bitty truck. Then I graduated to a Ford Contour with a spoiler. And for Christmas, I got a sound system. You know the speakers that had the lights on the inside? Anybody remember that back in the day? That, oh yeah, it was super cool. Uh, we used CDs back then for some of you Gen Zers. Those are round things that used to play music and you actually had a physical thing for music and you put it in the slot in your car, but I had one of those that like snapped off. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about, the like CD thing that snapped off so you could protect it when you weren't in the car. Anyway, I can explain that later. It's not relevant to the story in any way. The point of the story was uh, 16 years old and I lived in a small little suburb of Macon. If Macon were a big enough city, this would be a suburb. It was called Bolingbroke, Georgia. Georgia being my home state. And I was coming home from a friend's house at night. It was pretty late. My parents had a curfew set for me, like all good parents did. In Georgia, in small communities, you needed to be home around 9 o'clock or so to make sure that the monsters didn't get you or something. They were wise, and I'm grateful for them. But I was coming home, and I was running late. And I remember I was, I was uh, uh, trying to, to get in the driveway in just enough time that I'd honor my parents, meet curfew. And I pull in my driveway... And I'm doing the thing of like turning the car off, unsnapping the like CD thing. I mean, you got to go through the little motions of that. I'm getting out of the car and all of a sudden a car pulls in behind me in my driveway. And I'm sitting there going, uh, that's kind of weird. Um, and not only did the car pull in behind me, I saw the headlights in the rearview mirror, but all of a sudden I see blue lights. And I'm going, oh my goodness. Most, has anybody here ever been pulled over? Come on, let's see the honesty this morning. Okay, so y'all know that sinking feeling of being pulled over and I'm sitting there in my driveway going, oh no. So I get out of the car, I'm shaky, literally. It's the first time this ever happened to me since I had started driving. I begin to engage the officer. It was a Monroe County a sheriff officer, uh, a deputy, and he begins to say, uh, excuse me, could we have a, ch a chat? And I said, Sh sure. And he begins to tell me that I had been speeding down this little road and also that I had failed to stop at a stop sign. Well, immediately my pride kicks in. And I don't know what overtook me other than my 16 year old age being a knucklehead that I was. And I said, excuse me, I was not speeding. And, and, and I did stop at the stop sign, all right? And, 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 and it wasn't just like pride, it was like embarrassment because I was known as a really good boy. To this day, I like being a good person. Anybody in the room enjoy being known as a good boy or a good girl? And I, this was like shattering my, my rules following self because I don't break rules. I was very proud of the fact that I didn't break rules. And so he's telling me that I broke these two rules and I'm in my pride, beginning to defend myself, and my embarrassment, beginning to feel great shame. Well, it's compounded by the fact that my parents' bedroom window faces the driveway. So my mom and dad, in their pajamas, see the blue lights in their window. They begin to come to the door. They step outside, to my further embarrassment, in their pajamas. I'm standing there with the police officer, and they're just letting me get the lecture. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh, Mr. Officer, would you like to say more? So great shame. And in reality, this guilt overtook me because I felt guilty in that moment because I think even though I was defending myself, I knew that I was in a hurry to get home and I knew that I don't stop at stop signs for the one Mississippi two. You know what I'm talking about where you have to feel the car shift back? Can we just admit that that is ridiculous? 
Nobody should have to stop that long. But not only did I feel guilty, but I actually had an officer standing there in my driveway who had clocked my speed, was showing me his radar gun and had said, I saw you, don't, you didn't stop at that railroad stop sign. I was proven to be guilty. And not only that, he has trapped me in my own driveway. I am between him and my parents. In other words, surrounded by accountability. And I had nowhere to go. I guess three words that could describe the moment was I was caught, <laughs> I was convicted, and I was cornered. Well, this morning, we're going to look together at Romans chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. And the main point of the passage this morning is without exception, every single one of us is equally unrighteous before God and in desperate need of salvation. I hope you have something to write with this morning and perhaps even you think about writing down this main point as we study the passage for the day. But another way of describing what we're going to be studying today is this, that before God, all of us are caught, convicted, and cornered. In a similar way to the situation that I found myself in at 16, Without exception, every single one of us, and I'm also talking about you, <laughs> I'm trying to say this morning, you're not the exception because all of us tend to make ourselves exceptional, but none of us have an exception this morning. This is you. All of us are equally unrighteous before God and in desperate need of salvation. Romans chapter 3 I'm starting in verse 1, and if you've got your Bible, I'd encourage you to, to read along with me. Before we start this morning, I just want to remind you that this book that we've been studying, the book of Romans, is all about the gospel. The gospel, of course, is the good news. We've been talking about this again. Can y'all say this with me? The good news of what God has done in Jesus Christ to save all who trust him. Paul has been saying, I want you to know Jesus. He's wonderful. He's a savior, he's a redeemer, he's a forgiver, he's a grace giver, he is a one who can make you new. He is life itself. You were made by him and you were made for him. I want you to know Jesus. This is Paul's passion in life. And he wants us to know the good news of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And he talks about this in Romans 1, 16 and 17 for all of us have memorized this, y'all know what I'm talking about. So let's read it together. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, righteous shall live by faith. Paul has been talking to us about this gospel and now this gospel, how this gospel is not just nice, but it's needed. And the reason it's needed is because God's wrath is deserved. And he's been talking to us about who deserves God's wrath. And we've been studying this over the last week, so we've been waking our way through this book. But he talks about how in, in chapter 1, verses 18 to 32, the non-religious need the gospel because God's wrath is deserved upon them. Then he shifted, and we've been looking at up until this point in chapter 2, verses 1 to 29, how the religious need the gospel and how God's wrath is upon them because God judges not action, but what? The heart. We looked at that last week. And today, as we look at today's passage, in case we've missed it yet, Paul's going to come back again in the passage we're looking at today and say everyone needs the gospel. In case you don't see yourselves yet in this story of great need and desperation for the work of Christ, for the grace of God upon you, he's going to come again and say here in today's passage, you need the gospel, all of us. So let's look together, chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. 
Well, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar. For as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means, for then how could judge God judge the world? But if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come, as some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. Well, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside and together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. This is God's word. If you guys happen to take notes this morning, I would encourage you to do so. We're going to be walking through this passage. And my aim always as a teacher here, anyone who teaches and pastors here at this church, our desire is to help you know the Bible, not just to listen to us, but to really help you know and understand God's word. And it is a wonderful gift to have God's word accessible to us. So I hope this morning you'll engage in a way that will really help you to understand, but also help you uh, to live in light of what's taught and hopefully to also help you disciple someone else and what someone, me, is now discipling you in. So this morning, title of today's message, Everyone Needs the Gospel. From Romans chapter 3, 1 to 20. I said our main point already is without exception, every single one of us is equally unrighteous before God and in desperate need of salvation. There's going to be three points to today's message because there's three parts of the passage that we're going to be looking at. So I'm going to start with point number one. Um, as we make a list this morning, like I said already, in case you haven't heard, um, this passage is about all of us, every single one of us. And so as we make this list this morning, what we're going to be doing is listing out Things that are true of every single one of us, because that's exactly what God is doing through the Apostle Paul as he writes the Church of Rome here in this letter. So every single one of us is, number one, guilty under sin. Every single one of us is guilty under sin. And this comes from verses 1 through 9. Well, I need to explain verses 1 to 9 just briefly, give you a little context, because it, it is a little bit confusing when you start reading. Um, Paul is an incredible evangelist. This year in the life of our church, we have been focusing on engaging the lost, praying for the lost, and engaging the lost. We desire to see people come to know Jesus Christ. Our primary desire for the way that this church should grow should not be seeing people move from other churches, but winning the lost to know Jesus Christ. That is God's heart to see people coming into relationship with him. And all of us in ways similar to Paul are commissioned to be ambassadors for the gospel. Remember just a few weeks ago in our local ministry emphasis week, we were talking about how through us, God is spreading the fragrance of Jesus Christ 
to a lost and dying world. We all get the opportunity to bear witness to Christ. Well, Paul was, had a special role in the life of the church. He was an evangelist. He spent his life with passion, working to bring lost people to know Jesus Christ. And one of the things that we see in this passage is a principle of living missionally, okay? And this is just, it's not in the passage. I'm just trying to help frame up what's happening here in verses one to nine so you can better understand it because otherwise you might go, what is, what is he saying? So when you live missionally, what you want to do is you want to identify with those that you're trying to reach. There's a passage in 1 Corinthians 9 that speaks about this. I've become all things to all people so that by all means I might win some. So we're working first to identify, to understand the people that we're trying to win to Jesus Christ. And we're looking to where their hopes are. Where are their hopes? Where are their objections? Where are their fears? Where are their beliefs? And what we're doing is from the place that they are, we're working to, to win them to see how all of those things can find fulfillment in Jesus Christ. This is the work of just missional living, all right? So if you want to be more effective with your lost coworker or your lost neighbor, someone who is in your family over Thanksgiving even, some of us might be with people like this over the next week who are far from Christ, sit with them to listen to them and to understand what their, what their life is like what questions they have, what things are going on, frustrations, feelings, hopes, and dreams, and use those as bridges of opportunity into the gospel. Well, if you want to learn to do gospel work well, you've got to learn to minister contextually, which means you've got to learn to give honest answers to people's honest questions. Now, I say all that to say what's happening here is as Paul's ministering to the church of Rome, and he's helping them to know Jesus Christ. What he's doing is he's already been around enough, he's engaged with religious people enough to know the objections that are gonna come his way as he begins to speak to them about Jesus. And so what he does is he cares enough about them and he understands enough about them because of his identity with them to be able to actually take time to answer some of the questions that he knows they probably have, they likely have in their minds, as they're hearing him say, but wait, this religious background doesn't matter. It's all about the heart. Remember in the last section where he, he landed? And so what happens here is he begins to actually give voice to these objections that they have and begin to answer them in light of the gospel. So I'll outline really quickly um, the three questions um, that they have, and we'll just look at his answers and we'll move to the next section. But he starts by saying, then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way, he says. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. So question one that he's asking is, well, what advantage does the Jew have? That would be an obvious question. Well, if you're saying to me in the last section, then it doesn't really matter about your customs and about your circumcision, because what really matters is your heart, then they might be going, well, well why, what, does it even matter then that we are, we're, we're God's like prized people? Do you remember that? Like whole Old Testament thing, like what then, what difference does it make? And he answers the question there in verse one by saying, well, it does matter because we can see, you see there in verse one, to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. So what he's saying is, it does matter because God chose you. He entrusted to you his word. He revealed to you his character. The problem was not uh, that that didn't matter. It's just that you didn't respond to it. He, Jesus said in John 5, you search the scriptures in vain, thinking you'd find life in the, the words itself, but it was all meant to lead you to me, and they had missed. So he's saying the, the scripture has value that it was entrusted to you. The problem is that you didn't bring God your heart. And that was it about the whole time. The second question that he answers is, well, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faith, faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means, he says, let God be true, though everyone were a liar, for as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. So the second question he outlines is, well, does the Jewish unfaithfulness then, the fact that they didn't give him their hearts, they were entrusted these great promises, and yet it didn't work. Like, 
They ended up becoming a, a rebellious people. So then, does, what does that say about God? Does that nullify his faithfulness? And what Paul answers is, of course not. Because God's character is not dependent on people's response to him. God is who he is. He is unchanging in his character. He is faithful. There's a passage even in the New Testament that describes even when we are faithless, he is faithful. So what Paul's saying is, of course it doesn't change his character. The third question that he goes to answer is, he says, but if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means, for then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And he answers, or one more question, and why not do evil that good may come, as some people slanderously charge us with saying? Their condemnation is just. So the third question that he anticipates being raised is, well, okay, so if God's glory, God is getting glory from our faithlessness, he's remaining faithful, and then what does that mean? Like, are we actually able to do God a favor by being rebellious so that he can get more glory? And Paul answers similarly how he's going to do again later in Romans. Absolutely not. When you think this way, you completely misunderstand God's holiness. We don't sin that his grace may abound more. The whole point of understanding God is to be near him, to be submitted to him, to be like him. If you really understand God, then you will want to be holy as he is holy. So, Paul's taking time to actually walk through a couple of these honest questions, um, and he's working to give some honest answers. But the key here, I want to focus here on verse 9, because this is really where he's, he's trying to land the plane with this point. What then, he says, are Jews, we Jews, any better off? And what is Paul's response? No. Not at all. For we have already charged that who? All. Both Jews and Greeks are under sin. Under sin. I want to focus on this phrase right here, under sin. Because it's critical that every single one of us understand what Paul is saying. To be under sin is essentially... Um, him saying to us that we are unrighteous. He's saying all of us, Jewish people, Gentile people, religious people, unreligious people, every single one of us, what he's saying is I am trying to establish that all of us, every one of us without exception is under sin. In other words, Another term that we've heard, and I just told you, uh, but we hear in the scripture is unrighteous. Or another term that you hear in the scripture sometimes is lost. And what Paul is saying to us is everyone, everyone is lost. Um, it's a positional term. So what it means is like we're not right with God. Y'all know relationally like what it's like to be right with other people. Like, and what he's saying is like, there's this relationship that started between you and God, and now like, it's not right. Like, you and God aren't cool. Like, you're, you're on bad terms. Like, you're on the out. And the reason is because you have wronged him. The reason is because of what you have done against him. And that leads you to a place of positionally not being good with God. Uh, Tim Keller, uh, who I, no secret, love, um, speaks of unrighteousness in a way in one of his writings as talking about um, how we are citizens of sin. This past week, many of you know that I was in Central Asia visiting uh, with several, we have four members of our church who are missionaries in Central Asia in a strategic city 
uh, with um, a mission organization that we're a part of. And this past week, I was with them uh, to do some strategic planning with them and the field leadership, but also just to take lots of supplies over there and just care for them. It's the first time that I've been able to be there since we sent this group of four. We have a, a heart as a church to send missionaries to the nations to help those who have never heard know Jesus. And I'm so grateful. I, y'all would just be so stinking proud of these family, this family and these two uh, single ladies who are over there who are living their life with passion and purpose to make Jesus known to people who have never, ever heard. There's only 160 churches in the entire nation, only just a handful of churches in the entire city that I was in of 17 million people. And you go around in these huge neighborhoods, just of completely lost. But I was going into the country and I was noticing, uh, y'all know when you go through immigration, you hand them your passport, and what do they do, right? That moment of they like stamp your passport. If you've ever been to another country, you get this like stamp onto your passport page. Well, thinking about the, the, the term under sin, Keller talks about how it's kind of like having a spiritual passport. And the passport shows our legal citizenship spiritually. But our passport is either stamped one of two things, under sin or under grace. There's only one of two options for the stamp in your passport. And until you come to a point of belief in Christ and trust in him, repentance of sin, and wholehearted trust and surrender to Jesus Christ, the, the stamp in our passport is under sin, like not right with God. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here, is he's saying Jew and Gentile, religious and unreligious, non-religious, all of us are under sin. But the craziness of this is that the Jew would be like, or the religious person would be like, but wait, like my degree of sin is, is nowhere near the degree of sin of, of people who live in even greater degrees of rebellion against God. Like you're saying to me, like, I've got the same stamp in my spiritual passport under sin just because of, of small heart things as someone who's done these outward, like huge, like action things. Like you, you're really trying to put me in the same category of lostness as that? And all of us know people who have sinned, we believe, in greater degrees than ourselves. And you're right, there can be greater degrees of sin in a life. But there cannot be greater degrees of lostness. And it's huge that you have in your head the distinction between sinfulness and lostness. Because there's two different things. There are greater degrees of sinfulness, but there are no greater degrees of lostness in terms of our standing before God. The smallest sin and the, the most significant sin put us into a passport stamp category of not right with God. And all of us are equal in terms of lostness. I read an illustration to help uh, illustrate this and I thought it was really, really good. Um, Engage with your mind for just a second in an imaginary way. Are y'all ready? Okay. So imagine three people um, are going to set out from Waikiki Beach. Anybody ever been to Hawaii? So imagine Waikiki Beach. We're going to have a swimming competition. And we're going to have three people set out. They're going to line up on Waikiki Beach, and they're going to start swimming toward Japan. And the goal is to get to Japan first. All right, one sets out and we discover quickly he cannot swim at all. He sinks as soon as he gets out of his own depth. The next one, swimmer number two, we discover after watching he can swim, but he is a little bit like me when I tried to do the one mile swim at Boy Scout camp and yes, I did attempt it. I did not finish it, they still gave me the badge. It was a pity badge. Um, <laughs> 
I, it turned out I was not very good at that age at swimming. I was a weak swimmer. I couldn't even make it the mile. We watch swimmer number two. He steps up. He's weak. He founders for 60, 100 feet, but he ends up drowning off the coast of Waikiki. Now, the third swimmer, we watch and go, huh, he's, a kinda, he's really good at this. Championship swimmer, it seems. He swims strong for a long, long time. But after 30 miles, uh-oh, looks like he's struggling. 40 miles in, he begins to sink. And 50 miles off the coast of Waikiki, swimmer number three drowns. Now, the question I ask you is one swimmer more drowned than the other swimmers? No. It does not matter which swam further. None of them were anywhere near Japan, and all of them ended up just as drowned and dead as all the others. The point of the illustration is this. There may be some who trust in their morality. There may be some who seem to get further in their religiosity than others who from the start look like they're just drowning in their rebellion or in their sensuality. But regardless, neither of them have a righteous heart. Neither of them positionally can say, oh, I'm good with God. All of them, all of us are equally lost. We're equally condemned to perish. And Paul says, all of us alike, there in verse 9, look back at it. All of us, do y'all see this? I'm trying to make a point, and I want to move on until everybody gets it. He says, for we have already charged that who? All of us, both Jews and Greeks, religious and non-religious, are what? Under sin. In other words, all of us are lost. All of us are unrighteous. So the point that he makes, number one, is every single one of us is what? Number one, guilty under sin. Number two, not only are all of us guilty under sin, but all of us are affected by sin. Number two, all of us are affected by sin. Paul's going to give us a long list of the effects of sin. And what he's doing is he, he doesn't just want us to understand that like, positionally we're in this category of our passport being stamped unrighteous. But he also wants us to understand practically how we really do have a problem. And it's got its tentacles like going out in every nook and cranny of our life. Like if you, if you, if you want to argue the positional thing, okay, Maybe that's where you are. It's true. I mean, the positional thing is true. Like, we're unrighteous. We're not good with God. But, but let's just think for a second practically. It's hard to argue practically. You know, you, you might want to argue, like, with a police officer illustration. Like, you know, like, I, I, I'm good. Like, I didn't speed. I, I, didn't, um, I didn't, like, roll through the stop sign. But then he, like, turns around and shows you his, like, his like radar. And he's like, really? <laughs> like, look at this. It's the practical that's like trapping us in. And so what Paul's doing here is he's going, hey, but you're affected by sin. Let's look at verses 10 to 18. And what I want to do together is, is make a little list as we go through here, because in this list um, of the effects of sin on our lives, we can see practically how sin has had such a major effect. The first thing on our list is our legal standing before God. Sin affects our legal standing before God. This is verse 10. For as it is written, none is righteous. Okay? This is another word to say, another way to say all are what? 
unrighteous. Do you think he just said that in verse 9? Yes, he did. All of us are under sin. Think he wants us to understand this point? Yes, he does. None is righteous. And then in case you missed it, he's going to go ahead and say, I'm talking to you. No, not one. All of us have been affected by sin and that our legal standing before God has changed. We are in the stamp of unrighteousness under sin. It's a repetition of what he said. So the first thing in our list, the first effect of sin is our legal standing before God. The second effect of sin is our minds. Our minds. Verse 11. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. And then he says, no one, what? Understands. No one understands. This is kind of a repetition of what he said in Romans chapter 1, verse 21. He says, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. There's another place in the scripture, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, where Paul describes something similar. It says, they're darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, their hardness of heart. So in other words, what Paul's saying is because our hearts are wrong before God, then our minds cannot even understand truth about God. Uh, One commentator said this, he says, ignorance does not cause hardness of hearts. Instead, hard-heartedness causes ignorance. So what he's saying is, one of the effects of sin is our minds have been distorted. We begin to have a hard time finding a sense of a reality. We live in denial, not the river in Egypt, the other denial. Some of y'all got it. Okay, some of y'all think I'm very lame, and it's true. Um, But we live in denial. We like to think that we can define truth for ourselves. We, 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 we'll, we'll reason out, we'll explain away plain truths of Scripture, things that a kindergartner can understand, and we will find ourselves going, yeah, but our minds have been darkened. The third effect of sin, our motives. Our motives. Verse 11. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. And then he says, no one, what? seeks for God. No one seeks for God. It reminds us of Titus chapter 3, verse 3. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. The idea is there is not a single one of us left to our own that really wants to find God. It's, it's like Adam and Eve where we find ourselves like running away from God and hiding in the garden. Even in morality and religion we talked about last week, we find ourselves even in that working to get away from submission to God. We need to see that in these ways in our minds and in these ways in our motives of heart, it's showing us our own sinfulness. Fourth, the fourth effect of sin is our wills. Our wills. He says in verse 12, all have, what? Turned aside. And together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. This reminds us of Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, when the scripture says, all of us, like sheep, have, what? Gone astray. We have turned. This is a choice that every one of us have made. We have turned everyone to his own way. In our wills, we have wandered from God. We have said, you know, Like, I know, God, you say this, but really, 
I want this over here and I'm gonna go after it. I know that you asked for this, but I am determined. I'm gonna go my own way. Adam and Eve did this and every single one of us in our own ways, small and large, have done this. We have turned from God. I know that um, some of us may be confused by the phrase, no one does good, right here. Um, Because I know that there are many of us who recognize in our lives um, that there there are people who don't know the Lord, who do what seems to be incredibly good work, okay? I don't wanna minimize the levels of good that can come from even non-believing people. But what we're talking about here is a godly goodness. In other words, a kind of goodness that would put you in right standing with God. A kind of goodness that measures up to God's definition of goodness. And what we see in the scripture is that when we have to look at goodness, goodness is defined by two things. One is the outward form of goodness. So in other words, take um, the example of of feeding someone at the homeless shelter. That is an outward form of goodness. It is, in, in a way, reflecting goodness. But goodness is more than that, as the Bible defines it. It's also motive. It's both form and motive. In other words, it's doing the right thing, but for the right reason. And the right reason is always to abound to the glory of God. And what we know is for a person to be truly good, in other words, to be in right standing with God, their goodness has to match both the motive, I mean the form and the motive. And not a single one of us can say, even in our best efforts, that those efforts were motivated purely by the glory of God. For us as Christians, we not only repent of our sin, but we also repent of our goodness. Because even in our attempted goodness, we know that it has not been God-centered, God-glorifying, motivated goodness. So in our hearts, what Paul is saying is, the effects of sin, legal standing before God, your minds, your motives, your wills. He also goes on to say, your words. Look at your words. Verse 13 and 14, he says, their throat is an open grave, and they use their tongues to deceive The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness, and their feet are swift to shed blood. It reminds me of some verses out of James chapter 3, starting in verse 6. He says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. The image that Paul gives us here of our lips, of our mouths, of our tongue, is an image of a grave that has like rotting bodies inside of it. And what he's saying here is when words come out of our mouth that do not reflect the beauty and the goodness and the glory and the holiness of God, it is a sheer sign that our hearts are unrighteous, are sinful. What Jesus says, the mouth comes, what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. When we use our tongues to lie, to protect ourselves, when we use our tongues to hurt other people, to manipulate, to confuse, to be about sinful work and selfish work, it is a sheer sign that, yes, the declaration of unrighteous is true because practically we see in this this way Sin manifesting itself in our lives. Six, our relationships with others are affected. 
verses 15 to 17. He says, their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet here are swift to shed blood. And in their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. See, sin inevitably not only affects your relationship with yourself, but it affects your relationship with other people. And we'll look at the seventh one on our list, which is it also is going to affect your relationship with God. But as you think about sin, it affects your relationship with other people. You, it, it says here how we're after each other's blood. The idea is that literally when other people get in our way, like we're so idolatrous in our hearts, we so are about ourselves that when other people get in our way, whether it's me yesterday trying to get off the airplane and this dude stands up and I'm like, he totally cut in line. Like, there's an order. Does everybody know that? There's like an order. And the dude like comes from behind and is, is just pushing his way. And I'm like, literally found myself like very angry because I felt that I deserved to get off that plane before he did. The reality is even that is showing sinfulness in my heart. And we do this all the time. When people get in our way, how we'll, we'll push people to the side. We'll make ourselves the center of everything. And he says here, this leads to ruin and misery. Anybody ever had a broken relationship? Okay, that was a hard question. You don't have to raise your hand. Anybody... On the inside, raise your hand to this one. Care to admit that you were part of the brokenness. When there's relational discord and fracture, see, the sin in our hearts leads to brokenness in all areas of life. And what Paul's doing here is he's saying to you, do you, do you see yourself? Do you see as I'm making this list, like, this is you. This is you, like, in your heart. You've got a problem, like, your brokenness of heart. It's like bleeding out all over the place. Just look at your relationships and the way of peace. This is what he's trying to help you see. Look at this. Not even in your relationships can you say you've got total peace. The way of peace they have not known. Tim Keller says this, and I love the quote. When we do not live enjoying God's approval in the gospel, we do not know peace ourselves, nor can we live in peace with others. In other words, when things are out of whack between you and God vertically, things are going to be out of whack majorly between you and others. See the dysfunction between you and others as a key telltale sign that there is dysfunction, true dysfunction between you and God. Last but not least, our relationship with God. And this is the one that you should expect, but in a, in a way, you need to see this one as the key to all the other ones. He says the seventh effect of sin is your relationship with God. And he names it very directly in verse 18. He says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And I'd like for you to label this one, put an asterisk by it in your notes or something, or maybe you can label it as I have. This one right here is actually the root condition of all the others. Because this, what Paul's describing right here, no fear of God. This is the state of heart that really every other problem comes from. This at the, is at the root of everything else. So, uh, I'm going to take a second just to pause and consider it. And I want you to think personally, not just conceptually. Psalm chapter 111, verse 10. Many of us have memorized this verse. It's a key for us here at our church. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Can y'all say that with me? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if you want to be wise, it doesn't start by going to a textbook. It starts by learning in your heart this thing called the fear of the Lord. If you want to learn to be wise, it begins with a posture of heart. What is the fear of God? Well, it's a central concept in the scripture. Essentially, what you can understand it as, as an inner attitude of awe and respect, sober trembling, 
before the greatness of God. It's not, it's not necessarily, some of us in English, we like to think about um, like fear of God in the sense of like, I'm scared. But it's really more than that. It's, it's so much more than that. I mean, sure, like we tremble at his holiness and in, in light of our sinfulness. I was talking this week, two of our missionaries on the field uh, who I was caring for, I was asking a series of questions. I had one day where I was doing a debrief with them about seven hours and we were just sitting together. We, we, we spent seven hours at three different coffee shops and all we did for seven hours was just talk. It was fabulous. It was glorious. It's one of those moments as a pastor where my heart was just overflowing in joy because this is, this is such a joy for us as a church to support those who are on the front line of such needed work in the world. One of the questions I asked was, what are some things you've learned about God since you've been here that you've never known? And what are some things you've learned about yourself? And they were telling me about how they've been studying the book of Leviticus and how they always thought the book of Leviticus was just this book of rules and regulations, but what they've been learning is more about the greatness of God. And she said, she said, I've been learning that when I, when I come into the presence of God, I need to do so with greater recognition of how glorious he is, how great he is. I need to be aware, more aware of who he is so that I can, in my heart, like respect him more for who he is. And this is exactly what we're talking about in the fear of God. It's essentially Psalm chapter 16, verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me. It's this idea of in my heart, like every single one of our hearts is controlled by something. And, and what a person who fears the Lord, essentially what we're saying is it's a person whose heart is controlled by the greatness of God. See, what you fear ends up controlling you. And so what we're saying is what we fear the most, what, what has the, the, the greatest, like, oh, just joy in our heart, respect in our heart, wonder and worship in our heart, the thing that gives us attention the most and attentiveness the most is God himself. The fear of God always before me. I've set the Lord always before me. That's what it means to fear the Lord. And yet... What Paul says here in verse 18 of chapter 3 is there is no fear of God before their eyes. In other words, what he's saying is if you look at your heart, what you'll see is that that is not true of you. You have not always set the Lord before you. He has not been your everything. You have allowed other things to control your heart, to give you more joy, more satisfaction, more pleasure, more attention, more whatever. You have not lived in that way. And because of that, it shows you truly that this indictment is true of you. And because you've not set the Lord before you, all of these other effects have happened. Everything is connected to what has happened in your heart. And he says all this to say, all of us are guilty under sin. And all of us are affected by sin. And I close this morning by pointing attention to the last verses of the passage of our focus today and point number three, because this is where it all leads us. He says, all of us, number three, in light of our guilt under sin, in light of the practical effects of our sin, all of us are accountable, number three, accountable to God. We look back now at verse 19 and 20 as we close. Paul says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Essentially, what Paul says here, he says now, um, the whole point of all of this 
is not for you to like turn it into a ladder to try to like climb your way to God. Like it's not for you to, to hear all this and go, oh, like these are the these were the ways of God. Like this is the rules of God. These are the things you're supposed to have done. And so I'll just turn that into a checklist and I'll work on that to get back to God. That's not the point of the law. He says, we know, verse 19, that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. Why? What does he say? So that what? Every mouth may be stopped. And the whole world accountable to God. So he's saying, don't, don't hear all this and go, oh, oh, I need to do more. <laughs> then I, I need to try harder. I've got my list now that I've got to work on. No, no, that's not the point. The point of all the law and the point of all of these words to this point is not to, to turn into a ladder to climb your way to God because he says, for by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Because all the law can do is bring knowledge of sin. I talked last week about how the law is given to us like a mirror so that we can see ourselves, but it's not meant to take off the wall and use it then to clean ourselves. We need another instrument. So what he's saying is, I've said all of this from the chapter 1, verse 18, all the way to this point. I have said all of this, all of the law and the prophets have come to you and spoken to you for one singular purpose. That you may be silent. That you would come to a point of recognition. That you are not right with God. You have sinned against him. You have walked away from him and that is not right. You are unrighteous. Positionally, you are not in a good place with God. I told you the story earlier about my 16-year-old experience. <laughs> I've been caught and convicted and cornered. And I'm telling you, even more spiritually, all of us, the blue lights have come on, so to speak. And you can look at the radar gun and, and you can see, like, it's true. Like, I did, I've done wrong. Like, these things are true of my heart. I am unrighteous. I'm not right with God. Like, my life bears witness to it. And I am, the whole point of all of this, Paul is saying, is to back you into a corner to surround you, so to speak, to where you have nothing to say and you have no defense to make and you realize that you are in desperate trouble. If you don't get it here, then you won't understand it as we move forward. The starting point to gospel living is right here. The starting point to a real relationship with God is right here. Of recognizing I am wrong and I can't defend myself and I have nothing to say for myself. It is true. What he says about me is true. I am wrong. And then to be broken. To be broken over our own sinfulness of heart and life and to recognize that we are in desperate trouble. Keller says this, silence is the condition of the person who knows that they cannot save themselves. Silence is the condition of the person who knows that we cannot save themselves. So where does this lead? All of this? to point where you should go. I need, because I'm guilty, I'm affected by sin, I'm accountable to God, I need salvation. The whole point of all of this 
is to get you to a point of brokenness once, but that continues every day of life for us who, who know salvation, a recognition that I am needy for salvation and not salvation in a conceptual sense. I need a savior. I need someone who can come and save me. And next week we'll continue the journey, but I want to go ahead and tell you, Paul's already told us the point of this book. Because he says, the whole reason he's writing this book is that you would know a savior. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news of God, for in it, he says, the power of God to save For everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, what Paul is saying is, if you're at a point of recognition that you're broken and you need a Savior, then you're at a good point because the Savior is here and his name is Jesus. And Jesus came for unrighteous people. Jesus came to change the stamp in your spiritual passport from under sin to under grace. Jesus came because he loves you. He came because the unrighteousness that you have needs to be changed to righteousness. And he came to live for your righteousness so that your unrighteousness could be taken away by his death on the cross from your sin. He can take your unrighteousness and by his obedience, he can give you his righteousness. And by his death and resurrection on your behalf, he is a living savior who is a grace giver. He can forgive, he can redeem, he can make you new. He can take that rebellious heart and give you a heart filled by his Holy Spirit that wants to seek and surrender to God. Aren't you thankful for Jesus? If you're in a place today where you know that you're not righteous, then I want you to, I want to encourage you, whether it's for the first time or the five millionth time, come to Jesus. He stands ready to save all who admit that they need Father, thank you for this word today, and I just pray, God, that you would work it into our hearts and into our lives. Thank you, Father, for your abundant grace upon us, and we pray today, God, that today you would help us to know more of your grace. Lord, our mouths are stopped. Would you teach us more of spiritual silence? Would you teach us more of our own neediness and helplessness, defenselessness before you? God, would we learn to be silent in your presence and to recognize our desperation for you. But also, God, would we learn the greatness of your love and grace because in our desperate place, you came in your love for us. You came to work on our behalf. You came to save us who could not save ourselves. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your salvation. Oh God, I pray today that you would help us to hope in you. Help us, Lord, every one of us right now in this moment, help us to turn from ourselves and turn toward you. Oh, Holy Spirit, would you just give us life, life that looks away from self, looks to you. Please, Lord, help us to repent of our sin and help us to trust you, Jesus. Lord, bring new life today. Bring salvation, even to someone who is here in this room. I don't know who they are, but Lord, you know them. And they've been hoping in self and they've been living in sin. And today is a day of salvation. Lord, would you make them new? Even now, would you just give them grace to turn to you and to believe in you? Renew us, God, in the joy of our salvation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for watching this Bible teaching from Island Community Church. We want to encourage you to join us in person for worship soon. For more information about our worship gatherings, gospel resources, and ways to connect with ICC, you can visit us at iccmemphis.com or download our Island Community Church app. As we close, we offer a prayer blessing for you from Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope.